How's that? I heard you just fine too, Kenny. Just Anyway, it's, it, it's kind of a low crowd this evening. It's probably one of the lowest that we've had in a while on a Wednesday night. So it's good to see that uh, so many, though, are here and, and have come. And we've got all our excitement with Lear. You know, you know how she loves the excitement and being the center of attention. You know? <laughs> but Judy said she's doing well. It was the, the walkway alongside the fence over there, you know, that thing that we put in to make life better and easier. She kind of tripped over that, so that's where it all happened. I'm sure there are other details that uh, will come forward, so. But I, I think she's going to be okay, and that's Judy's uh, view. How about you, Mary? Were you out there, Mary? Mary, were you out there? Oh, so would, would she seem okay? Okay. Yeah. Is that the same shoulder? Yeah, okay. All right, we're going to continue our study of Ezekiel. Um, just a sort of a reminder of what it is we're doing when we study Ezekiel. Sometimes we think that these books that have the name on them, uh, in the Old Testament particularly, we think it's a, a biography of that particular person. You know, it's Ezekiel, so it tells all kinds of things about his life. And these books that we call the prophets, and the major prophets being the big ones, um, there are some things about his life. We talked about that, um, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, but um, we read somewhat about how he was struggling with going to do with what he was going to do, and then we, we went ahead a little bit, and his wife passed away, and uh, he continued uh, to do his work. And, but it's just little slices of his life. And so when you're reading it, you're not going to read the story of Ezekiel. It's more about what he taught. He was a prophet. What is a prophet? Someone specifically called out by God to go to his people and that was his job. And uh, I tried to compare him a little bit with Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a guy that just seemed to be overwhelmed by things. He kept doing the work, but at the same time, it would just emotionally be very hard on him. Ezekiel doesn't seem to be that bothered for whatever it's worth. And I suspect in some ways it could have been just sort of a personality difference because we're all a little bit different. And um, all of us handle things differently. And so Ezekiel, as far as we can tell, he just gets out there and does his job. And um, his job was to teach the people. Now, what do we know about these people that he's going to be teaching, just generally speaking? Yeah, Dave? Yeah. They're not going to be a receptive audience. And we're going to read this uh, in some passages today talk a little bit about that that they just weren't going to be receptive but yet Ezekiel was told to do what go talk to them anyway make them hear it and I want you to think about that because sometimes we we think in order for people to be uh, receptive to the gospel we have to make it in a certain way which is pleasing to them you know it's not offensive to them whatever, which is a very subjective term, you know. What is subjective uh, to some and what is bothersome to some is not so bothersome to other people. And what was that, Micah? Are you? Go ahead. You, you messed your hair up, so you might as well. Yeah. Maybe the hope is not lost. Maybe they'll have a change in perspective of mind. Right. 
Now, God doesn't seem to be worried about that. That's not a deal breaker with him, you know, in terms of, hey, you know, maybe you'll, you'll get them turned on to what you're saying. Yeah. Just tell them. Tell them what it is. And that's one of those things which, again, why would these people be in a bad mood anyway? Let's just look at it from that perspective. Captivity. Yeah, and so the go ahead, Larry. Well, that, just, that, that would make me upset. Yeah, I mean they've been they they you remember now these are the people who are in the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom, uh, has already gone into captivity um, by the Assyrians, and so in that sense, that's all gone, and I suspect there's some straggling people from the northern kingdom that probably were getting over into the, to Babylon as well. But the, the thing is, is that they've been over there. We understand how sensitive those people were to their land, and God said he promised the land to them. And what's happening? God is removing them. And they have, I think at least to a great extent, understood by the teaching and preaching of guys like Ezekiel and Jeremiah, and some of the minor prophets, that we understand that we're over there for something that we shouldn't have been doing. Maybe not willing to kind of accept it. We're going to notice some things uh, this, after, this evening where some of the things that they were doing, and it, it just shocks you to imagine that these people could be doing the things they're doing. Because why? Well, these are God's people, and they have the law, and and they should have a desire to, to want to do it. We Oftentimes when uh, we're trying to figure out what happens to children or friends or whatever, we'll say, you know, well, they were taught properly. Well, as far as I can tell, many of these people were taught very, very pop properly. Um, there was still the temple before they ended up going over there. So something was going along there that was related to teaching and communication of the things that God would want them to have. All right, so he's over there, and he's there, and he's going to teach the people. So we want to look at chapter 3. Um, one of the things, and this is probably one of the most well-known passages of Scripture, um, in the New Testament study of things. In other words, the principle of, you know, what do you do in order to be right in the eyes of God? And that's found when God is saying, I'm going to make you a watchman. So what was a watchman? Some of you have Bibles that have pictures and things like that. It shows what a watchman was. Anybody know? I mean, just guessing, what would you call it? Oh, Okay. Right. So they had a tower on part of the wall there, a third temple. You watch them. Yeah, we'd watch, yeah. Attack, uh, so they could prepare the city in case of sure. attack, watch for any buildings that were right. coming. So um, it's a detailed job of somebody to do that for you. Yeah, and it's, of course, it's not so much we've got somebody who may come and attack us. Right. It's be aware of what's going on. Make the people aware of what's going on. Make the people aware of the dangers that are out there. And so let's look at um, Ezekiel 3, 16 and 17, where we get this sense of who the, it, the judge is as relates to watchman is and prophet. Okay, anybody want to read? Go ahead, Larry. You want to get, uh, three? Correct. Uh, just do, that's actually a seven, but go ahead and, Go ahead and read until I get tired of hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of seven yeah. days, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, he shall surely die, and you give him no warning or seek to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life,
Okay, so his job is to just go out and teach people and tell them you're, you're sinning. You're doing, you're doing the things that you shouldn't be doing. And that's his responsibility. He's, in that sense, he's a watchman. He's aware. He wants people to become aware of their condition. But the thing I think is important is from a couple of perspectives. Number one, who's responsible for this sin that's being talked about or the sins? The people who are doing it. So this tells us that people are responsible for their own sins. Whatever things there might be that have been influencing them in a, in a way to sort of pull them in a wrong direction, they are responsible. So why is that important for us to, to understand that, just in principle, that, you know, I'm responsible for what I do? Accountability, Accountability and that's a, that's a way of saying uh, I shouldn't be leaning toward blaming on other people what I've, what I've done. And even though the people may have contributed a lot to you know what's happened to you but in the end i'm responsible in the end you're responsible for what you do and what's what's the role then of the watchman in the case of ezekiel what is it what's the responsibility that he has warn to warn them okay that's his job you you should go out and tell them um so who's responsible, I suppose? There's two parties that are responsible in the sense that, okay, if you don't go out and warn them, then you're going to be held accountable. And if you do warn them, then they t decide to just do whatever they want to do, then they're responsible. So for, and this is, this is a struggle I think a lot of us have. That is that when we are interacting with people and you know, we are aware of you know, things that they're doing that aren't what they should be doing. And we're thinking, I don't know, is this my business? Should I be, should I be the one to talk to them? Um, why, is that, why is that a struggle for us? I mean, I, I guess I can understand Ezekiel. It's all laid out there for him. This is your job. Don't take it personally, but... You warn these people, and they're not going to be receptive to what you're saying. So I think in some respects, he's going to have to take some hits. But at the same time, he walks away saying, I told them. Well, what about you? What about me? In, in terms of realizing that there are people. We know we have lost people all around us. Um, what constitutes in our own minds the kind of people that we should be go talking to, or a person that you should be going to talk to. Anybody? Yes, go ahead, Christina. Well, in the New Testament, we're commanded that when we see our brethren doing wrong, uh -huh. we're supposed to see it and take it as an incident and confront them. Sure, about eventually, it. yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so maybe it's a little bit easier, and, and I think that's kind of the way we often look at it, uh, you know, hey, Charlie, you, you know James, and so I want you to, you know, maybe consider going over to talk to him about a problem that he has. Isn't that how we kind of work this? Because we think somebody who knows the person is maybe more likely going to do the right thing, or at least help them. Well, they'll, he'll at least listen to Charlie, because they're friends. Was that a component of what was going on here with uh, Ezekiel? Was that an issue? No, it wasn't a matter of who, whether they're your friend or not. He was their friend because he was teaching them. In that sense. Okay, did I get anyone thinking about this or you have any thoughts about it? Go ahead, Jessica, and then your mom. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's not like most of them are stubborn. I mean, we get the idea that just about everybody's stubborn.
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think about that? Would, would you be OK with being Ezekiel uh, or do you want to deal with it kind of like you have to deal with it in your own life? Where I'm not sure I'm the person that really should go over there and talk to Rick, you know. I'm sorry, what? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he slipped that one out pretty easily, didn't he? Go ahead, Larry. Yeah. And it's always the right thing to do when you have a wandering brother to try to bring him back. Not only does that bring his soul back, right. God says that, uh, that, uh, it says, uh, we'll save a soul from death and we'll cover a multitude of sins. Yeah. So it's a win win situation. Right. So what's, uh, go ahead, Carol. Sorry, I, I left you hanging out there. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he, like he was very plainly set by God to go out and do this. And I get the the sense that with with him that he's just walking down the street or down a trail or whatever and if there's somebody there that's a part of the group you know he's going to talk to them uh, and so that makes for you know at least um, you know there might be people who might see him coming what might they do oh look out here comes Ezekiel he's going to get all over me but because he's doing it um, you know it's just a little bit like like preaching you, know, you have a certain license to stand up and say things which you might not normally say in certain situations and I, I said I get the sense that Ezekiel I mean he's meant to go do that he's told these people aren't going to like it and he's really not told that he needs to be real careful about how he goes about saying it anybody else yeah no Yeah, well, that's true, yeah. Yeah, okay, go ahead, Dave. You keep saying stubbornness. Uh-huh. Yeah, he doesn't say, yeah, he doesn't say, let's quit, let's just quit the whole thing. I mean, there is a sense in then that the reality is, is that you go tell them they're not going to listen, they're a stubborn people, uh, but I, I suspect there's got to be the hope that somebody might be will, might turn around. On the other hand, um, what's going to happen? They're going to end up in captivity more and longer. They've been told how they haven't been told, you know, this is only going to last a few minutes or a few weeks or a few months. You guys are going to be over there long enough to build some houses and to live there. Um, he has, a, he has a kind of an interesting role. I, I, when I think about guys like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, who clearly were not popular, and God didn't really, he wasn't worried about whether they were going to be popular or not, or whether they were going to, oh yeah, he's, that Ezekiel, boy, he's a great speaker. You know, he'll really get everybody turned on to obeying God. They have... You have to remember that the whole group of the northern people have just kind of almost become a part of the Assyrians. And then the people where the, where the temple still is, you, you might think that at least that might hold them together a little bit. But it doesn't seem to be doing that. Go ahead, Micah. Right.
Well, I think that's the way it is for most of us. I don't think Ezekiel worried about that, to tell you the truth. I mean, I got to go out there and do what God says. He says, let these people know that they, they're rebellious people. So I think that's where I'm trying to get us to think a little bit about how this works for us individually. And how do we go about this? And is this my part? Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure, a response that's a good one. Yeah. Right. And I do. I think that does kind of open the gate to his having a little bit more boldness because he's not worried about, am I going to say this right? Um, I know who they are. Some of them are my own family. And I know what God says for me to go tell them. It's not so much what I think is best. But, you know, I think um, a lot of times you'll hear people say, well, you know, I just don't like his attitude. I don't, he, you know, he came up to me and he told me that, you know, I was going to go to hell in so many words. And some people just feel like, well, that gives me the right to be not happy about that and to, to reject what's being said. I mean, if someone's going to approach me, then they have to be at least nice about it. Now, that may be true now, I think. What I'm saying is, Ezekiel didn't worry too much about that. And God wasn't worried about it. I mean, they were kind of already at a place where they just need to be told. And see, if somebody comes to you, just a second, Mary, it, it comes to you and tells you what you need to know, don't be so quick to say, I don't like her attitude, or I don't like his attitude. You may be hearing something that you really need to hear, and maybe you're the one who has to get over how you're reacting to what other people are saying to you. Go ahead, Dave. Good point, yeah. Yeah, and of course... That usually funnels its way down to us. Hey, I'm just up here preaching God's word. And if someone doesn't receive it well, or maybe you've really been trying to, you know, talk to someone, you've had great love in your heart, and it's just not getting there, getting through the, to the person, you know, what do I do? Do I just quit? And clearly in the case of Ezekiel, it's just get out there and do it. You know, get on the, get on the top, of a hill and just keep talking and maybe somebody will listen to you. Go ahead, Mary. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, Mary makes a good point, you know, about this. Uh, you get into a situation and you, you know, you know, maybe they just say something that's not terribly offensive, but, you know, it's, it's not right. And so you're thinking, oh, boy, now what's going to happen if I say something to them? Am I going to just, am I going to turn them off? And certainly if it gets them upset, somebody's going to tell you that you turn them off. So you have to kind of face that as a reality. But I just wonder what it would be like to be at Ezekiel. To me, there's a certain amount of free, freedom of, of being Ezekiel. Just get out there and just start preaching and just keep on preaching. Because that's what God said to do. And, of course, if you'll notice here, let's go up to uh, chapter 2, back up a little bit, uh, to verse 3 through 5. Uh, James, why don't you read that? Read it. 
nice and loud. Chapter 2, verse 3 through 5. And of course, my point is, you can't always measure success by conversions. I didn't say it's not a factor, but it seems like God's not worried about that. You know, he's, these people know, they understand, they've chosen to take a certain route, and so they're responsible. And, and, and God's, he said, he's saying in essence, I'm not responsible, they're responsible. All right, so go ahead, James. Three through five. Okay, so let's just take apart my sentence that I have up there and let's just try to figure out what it is I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make and, and trying to not give the wrong impression. I say you can't always measure success by conversions. Okay, so what's kind of the, the, the key word that makes this somewhat conditional? Always. Always. You know? I don't think it's right for someone to, to say, well, I'm just out here preaching, you know. I, I, I'm not interested in converting anybody. I don't have to. Randy read me that passage that said, you know, it's, it's in their hands. And again, there's that, there's that bit of truth. I mean, the reality is that we can't control whether people are going to respond favorably to the gospel. But that doesn't mean we should look at this sort of carte blanche and say, well, you know, it's not up to us. If, if we're not converting people, not really according to God and according to what he expected of Ezekiel, it really wasn't. At least the, the point of making the words come out in such a way to try to get people to turn back to God. Because it... it even though a prophet will say that, he wants them to return to God, when you read the things that Ezekiel is saying and that God tells him to say, that's not really the point of it. The point is, let them know they're wrong. Now, maybe they're going to respond favorably to it, but not, not too many of them did, as far as I can tell historically. Um, and so God's spokesman is not responsible for conversions. But that doesn't mean we should excuse ourselves. We look at what's going on and we're saying, are we, are we, are we leading people to Christ? Oh, well, Randy said it doesn't really matter. We're just supposed to go out there and teach. Well, yeah, I do think that that's the bottom line. We are to go out there and teach. But it's too easy sometimes to excuse ourselves from not maybe taking it that next step, kind of going back to what you were saying, Christine, and you were kind of getting at this too, Mary, that you know, maybe I have a responsibility to become more adept at sharing the message with people or to recognize that I'm trying to communicate to them. They're trying to be communicated regarding the fact that you're going to be obliterated, really, as a people. You're not going to go back to the land ever again. The city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. In the year 586, I think, was when the city was actually destroyed. They had nowhere to go back to visit. So the emphasis, it's just like when we think of, you know, what's, what's the best way to preach a sermon? What's the sermon that's, re that's required? And there are a lot of different sermons. But God had one particular one for these people. And that is, you've rebelled against me. You're going to get exactly what you deserve. That was what the sermon. 
And so I'm just going to have to trust the faith of God. I'm not going to say, well, come on, Lord, you know, maybe if you were just a little nicer to these people, they'd come back to you. Well, he'd been plenty nice to them for hundreds of years. And what happened? I mean, they, they actually, as we'll point out here later on, that we're talking about individuals who need to, in some ways, through signs, what we call, we call these illustrations, I guess. And um, they're called signs in this particular context here because it was going, the signs really were to, at least as far as my understanding, it's going to be more supportive to Ezekiel. He wants him to understand exactly what it's going to be about. And so there is somewhat of a story, you know, and isn't that what we think sometimes, you know, when we, we read the word of God and someone says, you know, I just, I like, I like an occasional story to go with it, to make it a little bit more interesting. I mean, there's a little bit of a trap to that. Because what you really want, I mean, in terms of what, the way God is, is reaching out to you is to say, look, I've done something to make your life whole. I've done something that shows <clears throat> how much I love you, and I invite you to respond to that. And we know that some people just aren't interested. But what we've already noted here, like we say that today very freely, oh, people just don't care. Well, what about in Ezekiel's day? I mean, God even told him. You know, he didn't say, you know, put together the best program you can and get out there and evangelize. He says, just get out there and tell them that there's a reason why you guys are over there on this river Jabbar, and you're really not going to be able to go back, at least most of you. Yeah, go ahead, Christine. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, a, and that's kind of a given. Now, I don't know, uh, maybe this is just a sign of getting older and you start looking back, and I don't remember, you know, when my parents were trying to raise their children that, you know, I, I heard them talk about, man, you know, people, this is the 50s, people are really interested in God, you know. It's the same thing, people aren't interested. People are worldly. And so I, I think even though we, we look at today and we, and we, we can make all kinds, we could put our list of why this world is so messed up and why people aren't really interested. <clears throat> but that's not, it shouldn't be the bottom line. And that's what our friend Ezekiel is being told. Go ahead, Luffy. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, that, and that's what you're dealing with generally. You know, you tell, there's a, tell them there's a need, and, <clears throat> and that just doesn't go across real well. You know, I'm, I'm feeling okay. You know, what makes you think your need is fulfilled? Oh, well, that's just for you, Loopy. It works well for you, but I don't, I don't need it. Yeah, is your hand up, Mark? Or, or, yeah. Okay. I saw one. I think it was your left. It was. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll, just, I'll, I'll get you a second, Rich. Go ahead. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, obviously we're looking at stuff like I was saying. Ezekiel, he was given specific words. Yeah, it's just like Paul, you know, we have to be prepared to either be yeah. seed planters or the water. Because we don't know, they would, like Mary would say, yeah. you know, we all, oh, well, we can't know what the thing is. Okay, here's an opportunity. Yeah, I'm going to mess like this up, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. One, two, three, yeah. Right. right. We need to be prepared to be yeah. either seed planter or water. We may not even know what 
Right. I mean, did, did God love these people? Yes. Did he tell them to go in there and preach more about love? He did. I, I mean, he told them that's, that's not the thing I want them to hear. They need to understand that they're going to be punished for what they're doing. But yet we're inclined, we get kind of Johnny One Note on these things. We need more sermons in this area. Maybe that will win people over. Go ahead, Rich. Sure. He's an inspired man, etc. Yeah. But from the standpoint that it's time to have a Yeah. And I think that's that's very true. Um, it, it doesn't mean they've given up, but th- what a person's saying is, right now, this is as far as we're able to take this, and there are other people out here who might be willing to listen. Okay. Any other comments on that? Go ahead, James. Yeah. Not only does he say, you know, and, he, and he says very specifically, tell, these are my words that you are to tell them. I mean, it's, so it's, it's not just um, something that we infer, you know, from what's being said here. Aha, well, it must be coming from God. God says, go give them my words. Tell them what I am saying to you, and you tell them. So that really very clearly is a a note of what the words that are so important come directly from God. And as we read them and we've got them, well, then what we need to do is to to honor those words. Now, just go ahead and these these were these uh, parables. uh, What's when a, a city was sieged? What was that? What does that mean? Go ahead, Christy. Taken over, okay. What else? Yeah, so that's kind of that's the end. Is but but this was a way of put, putting up to the walls a place where these people can't move and they can't get out. And the whole idea was keep them in there, and they'll eventually starve to death. Yeah, and so he he says. This is what I want you to do. Now, this is, I think this is real interesting because in, uh, I'd never really noticed it that much before. Look at that passage, chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. Micah, why don't you read that? Because notice what he's told to do, okay, what Ezekiel's told to do. Go ahead. Okay, do you see what he's, he's, told, he's told to do? Okay, I want you to, do, I want you to get the, I want you to make a little model. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what he's told to do of the city and of what's going to happen. So I just, 
I don't know if that was the kind of thing that interested uh, Ezekiel or not, but nevertheless, he, he, it's, a, it's a real live, here's what it is. You, now you can really understand. That's, that's a parable, if you will, a way of saying, okay, what you're going to do is going to re should represent to people what's going to happen to them. Therefore, it's a parable, if you will. All right, um, the, par the uh, sign of the prophet lying on his side, you can read that, and he was told you know, to just lie on his side and then switch over back and forth. And uh, let's go ahead and read maybe a couple of verses out of that. Uh, Robert, why don't you read Ezekiel 4, 4 through 8, please. Okay, so I, I find this one very, very interesting. You know, so what's, what's going on? People are walking by Ezekiel, and there he is. You know, he's lying on his side, and then after a number of days, he switches over to another side. And they're intended to get an idea of what he's doing and how it should affect them in some way. I suspect maybe it might have not have been obvious to them what was going, what was going on, but maybe there would be times when he'd have the opportunity to talk to people. Let me tell you what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Uh, then, um, we'll skip over the polluted bread one, but let's go down to chapter 5, 1 through 4, and then we'll, then we'll quit, because this is the prophet's haircut and shave. This was a sign for the people. Um, Rick Milway, would you read that, please? Uh, Chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. As for you, son of man, you have sharp sword, and take the youth of the heart of the razor on your head and do it. Then take the scales of the lamb and divide it in four. One third you shall burn in the fire as sin with sin, and the days of the sin will be two years. Then you shall take one third and strike it with the sword all around the city, and one third you shall Okay, so he was told to get a haircut and shave and then divide it up in a certain way to where people would learn a lesson about what's going on. All right, so that's the kind of thing that Ezekiel's doing. Now, again, um, you know, usually we think because if we got a sign, then what ought that to do? That makes people understand it a little better, right? And maybe it'll motivate them because it's, it's a nice story. Do you think that was supposed to work that way? I don't think it really was intended to. I mean, but it was, the idea was try to show these people what's going to go and what's going to come. Do what you can to make them aware of what's going on. And so you can see that he does have a job, and his job is to let the people know that through these things that I'm doing here, even though it may not much make much sense to you, it's a way of showing you this is what's going to happen to you as a people, and it's not good. So it's time for us to quit. For next week, 
uh, could you prepare yourselves by looking at chapter 6 through 10. This is, you know, as we go through this, um, you know, we're not going to go verse by verse. Sometimes we'll go a block of verses and we'll talk about these things in concept, which is what we've been trying to do. But if you'll look at 6 through 10, I think you'll be prepared to, to at least join in or listen and kind of know what's going on uh, rather than when you face it the first time when we just start talking about it. Okay, let's pray. Father, sometimes we want to know you and want to understand you and it's not always so easy. But we don't want it to be the same reason why the people of Israel, the people of Judah and Jerusalem, why they rejected. Help us to remain open, Father. Uh, help us to not want to fashion the gospel in, in a way that, that we think will suit people. We all know that God loves us, and that's the message we want to try to get across, but we also want them to know is that he hates sin. And the way that we're going to be forgiven of those sins, whoever you are, is by believing in the love of God and believing in him and the work that he did through Jesus. It's the only way. It's not through being a nice person the way the world thinks of it. It takes absolutely very little humility to live in that way. We thank you for giving us these stories and trying to get in touch with the people as they were there, and we're going to find out more so that they were individuals that were just really awful people. And we, we understand why God is angry with them and wants them to know that they've brought this on themselves. Help us, Father, to humble ourselves and reach out to the God who is so lovingly reaching out to us and let him take us in his arms and take care of us till the day we die. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.